I think I need a stool. So, uh, I'm sorry for the long day. Or not that sorry, but it's been a long day, I think, for everybody. And even comes across a little bit when you read the Gospels. You can see at the beginning of every Gospel, it's, uh, and they were going somewhere, or somebody came to Christ. It's always this feeling of like being moved around a lot. And of course, it starts early in the morning with Palm Sunday. And so I think all of us, we get that same feeling today, that we're sort of in a rush we have all these services, all these things moving back and forth from church. So I think it's really nice in the beginning of Pascha to just slow down a little bit and to reflect at the end, end of a very long day. And so that's what we'll do a little bit here. And I'm going to give you the goal right away from the start. The goal is I want you to leave sin behind. So if you get nothing from this talk, that's what it is. It's leave sin behind. And our motivation is the Lord has need of him. That's the verse. The Lord has need of him. You know, uh, Mark Gerges goes to this church, and when I was young, I remember Mark Gerges giving a sermon during Pascha, and he said that it's a good idea every, every Passion Week, every Pascha, to have one verse that you say over and over and over again, almost like the theme for your passageway, for your Passover week. And so this, for me, I think is going to be the theme for this week. The Lord has need of him. That's our motivation behind the goal of leaving sin behind. How? The how becomes, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. That's from the gospel, the first gospel, the first hour today. From John chapter 12. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. So that's how we're going to do it. That's how we're going to be leaving sin behind because the Lord has need of us. So I think establishing motivation is very important because it really is at the center of why we do things. You don't really make actions until you know, until you have a reason. Your motivation is extremely important. It's how God looks at us. It looks at our heart, right? He judges man by his heart. And, you know, there's a phrase recently I've been doing a lot of interviews in my own job for like different positions, trying to do some different things in my, and I'm getting a lot of interviews. And they're like, well, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do addiction medicine? Why do you want to go and work in the safety net clinic? Why do you want to do this teaching in the hospital? Why do you want to do that? And I always use the phrase, oh, I'm very service oriented. And now it worked. They let me work inside of a, a safety net clinic. And everybody over there, they're like, oh, yeah, this clinic is awesome. Everybody here is mission-oriented. All of that is like code word for Christian. Service-oriented, mission-oriented. It basically says like, yeah, there's a reason why I'm doing this sort of work, why I'm here, is I want to be of service. It's a very powerful and motivating thing to want to be of service. It's... It's transformative. If you know that you are needed and that your service is very important, it transforms everything about you. I'll give you an example. I am, after many, many, many years of bachelorhood, married with kids, three kids. I apologize if you don't have kids. It's okay. You'll understand the example because at some point you were a child. Somebody raised you and loved you, and so you know the importance of parenthood. And you know how basically it transforms everything about you. Everything you think about is, is your kids, is raising your family, is helping your family all the time. That's all you think about. It motivates almost every decision you make is because I, I want to help my family. I switch my positions at work so that I could be an hour closer to home during the workday, just in case. That's why I did it. I, I switched my position, my other position at work because I needed more time to be at home. 
everything that you do is for your kids and for your family. I'll give you another example. Right now, Lucas is here somewhere. He could probably hear me, but he's having PP accidents at school. For the last two to three weeks, that's the only thing my wife has talked about. Every conversation is about why is he going pee pee at school? How come he doesn't go pee pee on his on his pants at home? Why is he he sleeps overnight? He doesn't go pee pee overnight. What is it about? I'm like Maria, stop obsessing about the pee pee. That's all we talk about all the time. She can't help it. She's obsessed with with serving him. Every possible way of serving, she's obsessed with it. So I said, stop talking about it. It's too much. Today, after I said that, so she doesn't talk to me about it. I heard her whispering to our older son Cyril. Who takes some pee pee in the, you know, during his free time at school? She can't stop. There's no way she can stop thinking about it. And so it's the same thing when we have that feeling that we are needed, that God is telling us the Lord has need of him. When you feel that calling, you want to be of service. You will give up everything. All you can think about is how can I help him? He needs me. The Lord has need of him. Actually, the way I chose this verse is because yesterday they had this thing at um, Christ the Redeemer Church where they're doing a walk through Pascha week for all the kids. So you get there and there's like a, a room for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And so they, they show them briefly in five minutes. This is what God did during the Passion, the Passion Week, the, during Pascha week on Monday, on Tuesday, whatever. And as the Monday, Tuesday person was talking, I realized this is way over the head of my two-year-old. He does not get what's going on right now. They had a picture of like the, you know, the temple and cleaning out the temple. And they're like, and what's he doing? Why is there suitcases in the temple? Why are they selling? And of course, my two-year-old doesn't get, you know, he's two and a half. He doesn't get any of that stuff. And I realized what he was really thinking about, my two and a half-year-old. What is he thinking about the most important character for him on Palm Sunday? You guys know who I'm talking about? You know who this verse, the verse, the Lord has need of him. What's he talking about? Very good. Luke chapter 19, he's talking about the donkey. The Lord has need of him. And that's why I started thinking about the donkey. Because yesterday, all my kid could think about was the donkey. Because we told him there's going to be a donkey at church. They couldn't afford the donkey. They just got a little pony. And the pony was giving them rides around the, the parking lot. But the donkey is very, very famous. And it should, it, rightly so. One of my kids' favorite stories in the Bible is Balaam and the talking donkey. They love the donkey. So the donkey in Palm Sunday is very important. Even Disney, you know, tried to like take care of, you know, Shrek and the donkey. Like he's a famous donkey. And my, one of my friends from college became a priest, Abuna Joseph Arsenios. He's up north. And he gave a talk about the donkey of Palm Sunday a few years ago, and it was beautiful. So I stole some of his, his waza. And obviously, we should compare ourselves to the donkey. Actually, if you can open Luke chapter 19. Verse 30. Go into the village opposite you. Where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. Go in the village opposite you, whereas you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. A colt? What does that mean, a colt? like a baby donkey, like a young donkey, on which no one has ever sat, loose it and bring it here. So the first point, he's a colt. A colt of a donkey. So not even a full-grown donkey, it's a baby donkey. It's like a teenager donkey. It's a young donkey. He's young in the faith. He is of little faith. He's got no muscles. He doesn't carry any goods. He doesn't know how to carry anything. He's never carried a suitcase or carried a bundle. He has no experience. He's young. He's small. He's little. 
He's barely inside of the church. He barely comes to church, or she barely comes to church, doesn't teach Sunday school, is not experienced in the faith, is very small in the faith, didn't really grow up inside the church, in fact, was outside in another village across the way, not really inside of Jerusalem. Very young. A lot of us, I feel like we think of ourselves in this way when it comes to church and, and the body of Christ. I'm the small person in the church. I'm the young person in the church. I'm the young deacon in the church. I do serve, I'm young. I don't really know. How young? No one has ever sat on it, has never had field experience. You want to take the king of the universe and put him on top of this one that's never had any experience ever, has never carried anything ever, and you expect him to be able to sit and not buck and move and whatever, that his first attempt at carrying somebody will be God himself? As people are throwing flowers and, and everything in front of him and, and making a joyful exclamation, yelling and screaming, this is the one? No experience in the service whatsoever has never said God out loud at work or at school or talked to anybody about their faith. There's zero experience. How can I be of service? I don't know anything. I've never done it before. Nobody has something that, there's nothing I can say that some people want to listen to. I have no value to anybody. You can't get anything from me. He's young and inexperienced, never carried anything. I know many of you actually are thinking about, I think you have a, a mission trip scheduled for Africa in June or, or July of this year. And there's like so many people when they first go on their first trip somewhere like this, they say, well, what am I gonna do? I've never preached before. Am I gonna stand in the corner and like talk about Jesus? How's that gonna work? I've never gone to a visitation in my life. How can I do that? I'm not even a Sunday school servant, how can I go? I'm going to get in front of somebody and I'm not going to have my notes and my PowerPoint. I'm not going to know what to do. What will people think of me if I go on this trip? Am I making myself a hypocrite by going on this trip now? Because everybody knows where I come from. You know, this could also, it could stir the pot. I'm not used to this and I don't, I don't want to mess things up. My life is stable right now. Why do I have to go and, and, and mess things up a little bit with this trip? I don't know what's going to happen. I'm fine where I'm at right now. Why should I do this service? I'm not familiar with it. This is not for me. Leave it to the pros. Leave it to the experts. I'm, I'm not that person. I'm ignorant. I want you actually to think about your no's recently when you have said no. Think about the last time you said no to a service. I think it's important when we realize we're saying no to a service and why are we saying no to the service? And actually, I'm a little bit ashamed because as I've grown older, I'm actually asked to do service less and less often. And I think it's because I've become accustomed to saying no. And when you start saying no, I'm not available, you start getting asked less and less and less for service in front of you. And why am I saying no? Why are we saying no? Oh, I'm busy. I have other obligations. I made other plans. I've really been out of it for so long. I don't think I could do that anymore. Why are we saying no to the service? And sometimes perhaps there was not even a question that was posed to you, but you're still saying no to the service. Because like no one, maybe no one said, hey, Jimmy, you should go to Africa with, with HTC in July. So Jimmy never volunteers because he was never asked. But Jimmy knew that there was a trip happening. He knew it. And he was thinking about it, but nobody ever asked him. So it's so easy. It's much more comfortable to say, staying quiet. Or in your own house, nobody asked you to wash the dishes, but you know that it would have been really appreciated or to help with bedtime routine. Or nobody asks you to check on your kid's homework. And it can easily just be like, well, the next day he probably did. 
Nobody asked you to like check on your friend or to read that chapter or to stand up and pray. Especially as you go older, nobody's checking up on you anymore. When you're growing, when you're out of the house, everything depends on you. And if, if you decide not to like, you know, weigh down your conscience, you don't have to even say no anymore. After a while, you're not even saying anything. It's just happening without you even realizing. The no's are just subconscious now. So it's very important that you slow down and realize what are you saying yes to and what are you saying no to now in your life? To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Right? From St. James. And you notice St. James says, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it. It's not but, and. He's compounding the two. He's not showing a difference. He's saying it's, it's, you're compounding it. You need both and then you have sin. And here now we come to the object of sin. If you know to do good and you don't do it, you're in sin. And notice the language that, that our Lord Christ uses with the donkey and with sin. Loose it and bring it here. The colt, the foal of a donkey, no one has ever sat on it. Loose it and bring it here. Because sin, it shackles us. It ties us. Loose it and bring it to me. We need to be loosened from sin. It's a very important phrase. Because sometimes we don't realize these consequences of sin. We forget. But sin, it ties you down. It loosens you. The donkey wasn't free to just roam around on his own. He was confiscated. He was shackled. The sins of this world, they tie us down. And you're a slave to those sins. You can't serve both God and mammon. My dad told me, I remember a long time ago when I was a kid, he said, the church fathers say that the devil always hits you with sin in two ways. His right hand is obvious. That is like temptation. You know, he puts the sin beautiful, you know, the fruit in front of you looks juicy and nice and whatever, and you fall for that sin. You made a mistake and you fall down. And then the devil hits you with the left hand. What is the left hand now? The one that you weren't expecting. What's that one? Look at what you did. I can't believe you did that. You should be ashamed of yourself. That's just what, just like you to do something like that. That's dirty and bad. You're a shameful person. Shame on you. You don't deserve any better. You're useless. You're worthless. You're a slave. That's how sin works. You fall, and then he kicks you when you're down. That's sin. You're so tied down that you don't think there's any way up. That's how sin works. That's its goal. You're good for nothing. There's no repair. There's no way back up. You cheated on your family like that? They don't want you back anymore. You do that in the church? They don't want to see you at church anymore. You don't deserve to go to church around those saints, those holy people anymore. You're my slave forever. You know, the devil roams around, roams about like a, a roaring lion, seeking who he might devour, right? In Romans chapter 6. So we need to be loosed. We need to be loosed from this cycle of sin. And who does God send to do this? How do we get loosed from sin? If you go back to Luke 19, right, we said, go into the village opposite you where as you enter, you'll find a colt tied. Us, the donkey, were tied up. Who did he send to go get the donkey? Yes, in the verse before, he sent two of his disciples. And this is where maybe our Protestants in the room will be like, uh, this is a little bit funny. What do you mean? God forgives us our sins. He's the one who, who unbinds us from sin and that's it. It's God. I agree with you, yes, but he sent two of his disciples to loosen the cult, to loosen it. And in at least two or three places in the gospel, it's very clear that Christ sent his disciples. He gave them the authority to loosen us from sins. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty direct. You're going to have the keys to the kingdom. 
That's very straightforward. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Is it just a flip of the words? He used loosed here for the sins and he used for, loosed for the, the donkey. He used it on purpose. And that's in Matthew chapter 16. Then in, in the Gospel of St. John chapter 20. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Clear. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So here we have the sacrament of confession is very clear. All of us need to be broken from the cycle of sin, and it happens through confession. And here we are at the beginning of Passion Week. You have Pesca Week, excuse me, you have all of this great week to confess. And even though we suspend some of the things that we do in the church, we focus only on Christ, confession is not suspended. You can confess all the time. We need to break the cycle of sin. It only happens through forgiveness. And our Lord God, he knows that we need to hear Abuna say, your sins, which are many, are forgiven. It's very important that we know that, that God, Christ, forgives us our sins. Because otherwise, we let the devil with his left hand take advantage of us, keep us mired down in sin and dirtiness and filth, and that's not what God has planned for us. He wants to loosen us and free us from the shackles of sin. And you know what? Our Lord Christ predicted it. But somebody's going to stop, try and stop you. Right? And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say, because the Lord has need of it. The Lord needs them. I'm loosening you from sin because I need you. That's a very strong word, need. I've been trying to teach my son the difference between want and need. Because my sons will say, Dad, I need chocolate. I have to say, Cyril, you don't need chocolate. You want the chocolate. But you don't need the chocolate. The other day, he's very philosophical. Dad, I really need it because I want it. And when I need something and I want it, that means I need it. Very logical. It's very hard to argue with him. But our Lord Christ uses it because he understands the word. The Lord has need of us. Isn't that interesting? It's a very functional word, need. He needs us. So the owner said, why are you loosing the coat, the colt? Loose, letting loose. Why are you loosing the colt? The devil has been cultivating us for years. You know, on average, how long does a donkey live? How old is this young donkey? Donkeys live on average in captivity. I had to look this up, obviously. I'm not a donkey herdsman. 33 years, which I found a very holy number. 33 years. And usually you can saddle a colt and start to train them and everything at about three years old. So between three and six years old is when they first start carrying a load, carrying a person, etc. So this owner has been cultivating this donkey, his whole life, for the purpose of him being his donkey. The devil has been trying for your whole life to ensnare you in sin. He's never going to stop. He wants you to be bound and chained and have you inside of his, his grasp. He's been trying for years to do this to you. He's not going to let go of you easily. It is a struggle. So who will you allow to be the owner? Or will you say, I don't deserve this. I'm not ready. I'm too young. I'm not worthy. I've been sinful my whole life. It's not just that I should be saved now. I actually deserve to die. We believe that about ourselves. We believe the devil's lies after a while. These are the consequences of sin. You know, now that I'm doing a little bit more of addiction medicine, even when I wasn't, even in regular practice, you see people at their lowest when they come. I'm sure when they go, come to Abuna and they're confessing and when they, you go to your doctor, you tell your doctor everything. And so I hear about these things that like are they just break people. Sin, it breaks people around them, but it also breaks the sinner themselves. Like when the person comes in and they've cheated on their spouse. They are miserable. They regret it. 
They can't stand it. They're ashamed. That's the consequences of sin. You're alone. You're abandoned. You're addicted. You have no rest. You're in despair, despondent. You have hate that develops, racism that develops. All of these things are the consequences of sin. And we know the wages of sin is, is death. There is no justice in this world. How many of you have really experienced sort of like real injustice or real despair? You know what I mean? Like real discouraging things that have happened in your life. Like, like your spouse has cheated on you. It's terrible. How could there be justice after that? How could there be mercy after that? Or your boss has lied to you. Your partner has cheated you, has st stolen your life savings. Like real despair. Real despair. I had a, a friend, another friend in college who uh, came to the Christianity, came to the church because of the Coptic club and the Coptic people around him. And then recently posted a video talking about how cops are heresies. Coptic, he said Coptics are heresies. And I was so betrayed. And I mean, where's, where's there going to be justice? Where's there going to be mercy? For example, recently there was that family in the St. Athanasius Church, Nancy and Kareem Iskander. You guys heard about this case, of course. They were crossing the street with their four kids. And an, a former professional baseball player and his mistress both driving rich cars, drunk, speeding and racing each other, went through the intersection and slammed into them and killed the two kids instantly, Mark and Jacob Iskander. And they've been trying to escape justice for the last few years. She was finally put on trial and found guilty on all charges. So what's the justice gonna be? She gets one life sentence? Or maybe the judge will say, oh, you killed two kids, two life sentences, emblematic, symptomatic of like justice happening. What's justice? Where's mercy here for this parents that lost their kids? Tragically, unexpectedly, with no reason except for sin. Or maybe the judge will say, oh, you ruined the lives of the whole family. You get six life sentences. Is that justice? Is that mercy? The only real justice will be bring the kids back to life. Erase the sins from the past. That's real justice and real mercy. And where do we find real justice and real mercy? Only in Christ. Who is the only person that can bring them back to life? Only Christ. And who is the only person that can erase those sins? Only Christ. There is no way that we can have full justice and full mercy on this world. The only way is Christ alone. That's the only truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want true justice, true mercy, it has to be in the incarnate word of God. God himself coming down as a man and in full humanity, full divinity, without mingling, without confusion, without alteration. And he says, I am the one. I'll be the sacrifice for everything. That's where justice happens. That's where mercy happens. Could there be any better justice or mercy? It's impossible. That, that is the only way. That's the only logical way. It's through Christ alone. And a lot of times when you tell people in this world this story, they'll be like, oh, okay, now you're being Christian. The way to salvation now is love. It's going to solve all the problems. Love. Love of Christ. Yes. That's the only thing. You got the Middle East. Palestine and Israel and genocide and babies dying and, and terrorism. And they hate each other. They absolutely hate each other. And you're going to say, all you're going to do is say, love, Jesus Christ will heal all their wounds. You are minimizing the struggles of a thousand years and millions of people. You don't know anything. You are oversimplifying. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. That's, this is a complicated issue. It needs a complicated solution. And if you just throw, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's not enough. But I tell you what, it is enough. Yes, now we have this 
simple summary of Christianity. But it was not come to by simple minds. That is the beauty of God. That this is the only true solution is Christ, the word of God. That's it. That's kind of like, you know, if you want to make a bad example, like uh, Einstein coming up with E equals MC squared. A beautiful and simple formula that summarizes all of like how the universe and physics works. He took specific relativity and general relativity and he, he made it into this equation, E equals MC squared, a beautiful, elegant thing that defines energy and mass. And it's beautiful. And that is an oversimplification of all the rest of physics. Nobody ever talks about, well, E2 equals M2C to the fourth plus P2C2, which is, uh, you know, momentum. And we don't talk about all that. We give you the simple equation, E equals MC squared. John 3, 16. That's it. It's not, it's not irrelevant. It's just the simple equation for true justice and mercy is in our Lord Christ. And I'm not going to it saying that that's the only message that we need to give. I'm not saying forget all the, you know, I, the whole thing has been about giving up sin. It's not just jumping to the end and finding like peace and love. There's a struggle that happens. When you go actually to the first hour in John chapter 12, what happened was there were Gentiles, there were donkeys, Greeks. Here you go to uh, John chapter 12. And now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So these Greeks, these Gentiles, these donkeys, they came and they went to Philip and they said, we want to see Jesus. And Philip, St. Cyril of Alexandria says, Philip was thinking about when Christ said, go to the Jews. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Go to the Jews and, and, and go to them. So he didn't want to go to Jesus with these Gentiles. So instead he went to Andrew. Andrew in the Orthodox Church is like the first one called. Andrew had experience bringing people to Jesus. And he went to Andrew and Andrew and Philip went together and they went to Christ. And then how did Christ answer them? Did he answer them, okay, I'll go talk to them? Or I'm not going to talk to them? No, instead he said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So he told them basically, you have to be with me. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. So we have this message of salvation and it comes through the struggle. You have to go follow Christ through this whole Pascha week. Follow him through the crucifixion and into the resurrection. Okay, I read this recently. And I'm almost done, I promise. I read this recently. There's a Japanese word. It is called fumi. F-U-M-I-E. Fumi. There were Christians in Japan 500, 400, 500 years ago. And they were utterly slaughtered. The Christians in Japan. And we have letters from some of these Japanese Christians. Okay, I'll read you a little bit of the letter. But what is fumi? Fumi is this practice where they took a picture of Jesus Christ or a picture of the cross or a cross and they put it on the floor. And the government would go to these villages and say, come and step on the cross. Come and step on the face of Jesus Christ. And if you refuse to step on the cross or Jesus Christ, they would kill you. They'd burn you at the stake. So 
This Christian in Omura, Japan, was burned at the stake at Nangansaki, Japan, in 1622. And we have his letter. He said, Oh, if you taste the delights with which God fills the souls of those who serve him and suffer for him. Taste the delight which God fills the soul of those who serve him and suffer for him. How would you condemn all that the world would promise you? You'd leave the whole world behind for the joy of serving and suffering with Christ, of being needed by Christ. You would give up the whole world for this. He was in the jail for half a year, had a fever for a hundred days. Just a few days before he was burned at the stake, they burned others at the stake. 50 people on one day, and he was with a group of 25. And what they did was they had a huge fire, and they put 25 stakes up and tied them all up in a row. The amount of wood to burn all those people, they had about 20 feet of wood. So the fire would start to burn, and over two hours, it would make its way towards you. So you would see the fire for two hours coming towards you slowly until you actually died yourself from smoke and burning and everything else. So they were suffering for hours. So this is the extent, though, that we will go through serving and suffering and being needed for Christ so that we get to the resurrection, that we get to the loving part after. But it takes so much effort on your part to be loosed. I have need of you. So this is our memory verse for the week. The Lord has need of him. Despite all of our shortcomings, being young, being inexperienced, being tied down with sin, he sends you the church and the disciples and the sacraments. He wants to loose you and use you because he needs you. Every single person. He knows where you are, which tiny village who is your owner right now? All the sins you have done. He knows all those things and he sends disciples specifically to you because he needs you, each one of them. And glory be to God for that.